morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you that aren't in the morning, as I am. Um, I want to welcome you here, and um, we're, I'm going to run through this quickly. If you need answers for collections care uh, problems, please go to the online forum. We are beginning to get more um, action there, but we are happy to answer questions if we can. So uh, check that out. You need to be registered, but um, that's easy and it doesn't cost anything. Um, you can see all of the past webinars in the archives on the website, so check those out. And I post the recordings usually a day or two after each webinar, so if you miss one or you want to see one again, you can do that. This is how you can contact me, um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. We have uh, the community website, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, and there's the new email list has started. It's only for announcements and no discussions. So if you need to contact me or you want to reply to something about something on the listserv, um, send it to me directly. Um, not, don't reply to the list. And uh, next month in June, we're having something on firearms in museums. And in July, we're going to do something on crowdsourcing. Both of those should be really interesting. So check out the website and you can register. And today's uh, webinar is about hazardous collections. And I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. So here we go. If you have questions, please post them in the chat box. I will catch them. There are going to be three sections in the webinar for questions. And the, the speakers are going to be curating them. So uh, I think they're going to be grouping them together so that it will save time. And at the end, if there are any extra questions, I will catch them. They will answer them in writing, and I'll post them with the webinar. So thanks. Here we go. Thanks, Susan. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Karis, and I'm going to be starting out our talk today. Anne, Kathy, and I are here representing the AIC Health and Safety Committee. AIC formed this committee to provide educational and technical information on safety hazards and general health issues related to the conservation profession. One of the committee's main objectives is outreach, like this webinar, to make sure the collection care community and not just conservators are aware of health and safety issues in your work lives. Anne and I are both object conservators, and, Casey, and Kathy is an industrial hygienist, which is a specialist in occupational health. Kathy is recently retired from the Smithsonian, so she has expert knowledge of both health and safety issues as well as the museum environment. One of our goals of this talk is for you to understand the difference between what Anne and I do and what Kathy does as it relates to health and safety and why it's important for collecting institutions to have relationships with both professions. So we'd like to ask you some survey questions just to get a little bit more information about what our audience is like today. So Susan, do you want to put up the first one? And then I think we can put up the second one when you're ready. Susan. I'm just going to ask where you're from. So I'm seeing that we see uh, that we have several people from outside the U.S. and I just want to tell you that many of the procedures that we're talking about today will be specific to your location. 
So we can post websites and resources related to other regions outside the U.S. after the webinar, but if you have any specific questions um, about European locations and things like that, you can email us and we can give you specific questions as well. I think we're ready. If people are done answering, we can put up the next question. Which is whether or not you think that you have hazardous objects in your collection. And then, Susan, I think you can put up the next one, too, which is, do you already have procedures in place to protect workers and visitors from health and safety hazards? And then our last one for right now is whether you work with health and safety professionals already. Sorry, no, if you work with conservators already. Sorry. <clears throat> and the last one is about health and safety professional. Okay, so the goal of our presentation is to help you identify possible hazards within your collection and make a plan for mitigating the risk. Basic health and safety should be a part of your overall risk management program for your collection. What this means is that when we think about all the things that could happen in our collection, we tend to focus on what negative things could happen to the object. <clears throat> what happens if this object falls off the shelf? Here we're going to shift the focus to the human element. What happens if this object falls off the shelf and onto me? You should consider your own health and safety to be equally as important as the health and safety of the collections in your care. So after we talk about some identification of hazards, we're going to discuss how to design a management plan so that you know what you can do on an administrative and collection care level, what you can do on an object handling and conservation level, and what may actually require professional health and safety assistance or very specialized training and licensing. Since we're practicing conservators, we completely understand the limited resources museums and historical sites have. But there is a point that you really will need to want to collaborate with specialists. So we'll go over some case studies to demonstrate how you can do that. If you need a specialist, how do you find one and how can you determine if you're selecting the right kind of help? And finally, we'll discuss some resources if you don't have staff at your organization. We'll take, as Susan said, we'll take a break after each section so we can have a question and answer period. And we'll be monitoring the, monitoring the chat for questions. But we'd appreciate it if you can um, kind of keep the chat box to questions so that Anne can pick them up for you. For the most part throughout the talk, we'll, t uh, we'll be providing general recommendations since it's difficult to make claims about health and safety issues without knowing your specific situation. The Q&A periods will be your opportunity to ask us about more detailed scenarios. So what exactly are hazardous collection materials? A material is considered hazardous if it has the potential to cause injury, illness, or death, cause damage or to or loss of equipment, property, or collection, or inhibit operations such as restricting your access to storage cases. I want to mention the examples we're providing here are just a small sampling of the kinds of hazards you could find in the collection, and each one of them could really have their own 90-minute webinar. 
The idea here is to raise awareness and provide resources for you to go get the specific help you need. Hazards can be either inherent or acquired. So let's look at some of the examples of what this means. Many objects are hazardous by nature or design. The hazard is often not apparent and may require specific knowledge about the collection. These include toxic plant specimens, mineral specimens that are heavy metals or radioactive, and chemical or medicinal sets. Some objects can also cause physical harm. These are objects that are heavy, sharp, or breakable, things like spiny shells and flammable materials such as alcohol-based preservatives. These hazards are often very apparent, but the hazard is so often assumed they may be overlooked. Heavy objects stored high on shelves may seem stable, but it could become dislodged during an earthquake. Certain materials were deliberately incorporated into an object during production. In some cases, to capitalize on the properties related to their hazardous nature, such as with weaponry, rifles, hand grenades, or gunpowder. Hazardous materials may have a particular property that is intrinsic to the function of the, or value of the object, and these include luminous instrument dials painted with radium-based paint, silks with arsenic added to increase their weight for sale, felt hats stiffened with mercury, liquid mercury used for quick and accurate measurements in thermometers and gauges, and cadmium lead and chrome-based pigments used for their durability and color. These hazards will become apparent once you've conducted collection care research into, into production techniques. <clears throat> Sometimes at the time of manufacture, the hazardous nature of the material was not known and has only become apparent through recent study and health assessments. For instance, asbestos was added to art plasters and stuccos used for decorative work because it was cheap and plentiful. This kind of plaster was commonly used in exhibition dioramas or taxidermy mounts. Another example is uranium, which was added to specialty glasses, poisonade jewelry, and certain glazes on fiesta wear. These are often hidden hazards. For example, materials containing uh, asbestos were widely used, rarely documented, and difficult to identify by sight. Deterioration or damage can result in materials becoming more toxic or unstable. These processes are often unpredictable, can occur without any warning signs, and require more in-depth knowledge of collection and production techniques in order to identify. They also offer the best examples of when you should consult local hazardous materials specialists. For example, the reflective surface on historic mirrors was created using tin and mercury. In good condition, the mirroring is not hazardous, but once the deterioration process begins, liquid mercury and vapor is released. County environmental protection agencies can assess this and contain and remove the mercury. Nitrocellulose film becomes extremely flammable upon decay. If you're unsure of how long this film has been stored, leave it and call the fire department. They're always happy to deal with this kind of situation before rather than after you have the fire. Other materials which we discussed already that were hazardous by nature can become even more dangerous as they deteriorate. Any movement or dismantling of an asbestos art plaster can release airborne fibers. An abatement specialist needs to help you with this. Medicinal and chemical collections can change with age, creating highly reactive or explosive mixtures or off-gas toxic materials. If you're unsure of the age of your, condition, of your collection or its condition, you should, again, try and call your fire department to help you. Some pigmented paints can powder over time and pose inhalation and ingestion hazards and ammunition can become unstable. For example, grenades form highly explosive peroxides as they degrade. Local police departments will safely remove old gunpowder horns and inspect old weaponry. They usually will safely remove the hazardous materials and return the object to you. Objects can acquire toxicity through treatment. These kinds of hazards may require specialized knowledge to identify since even if you know your collection, you may not be aware of historical and modern treatment techniques that have been applied, especially if proper documentation or institutional knowledge is not available. However, you may have some clues that pesticide treatments, for example, have been applied. Some pesticides will leave 
residues or have a characteristic odor. Some highly toxic organics like naphthalene, which is what you find in mothballs, will recrystallize on surfaces of objects and cases, providing inhalation hazards. Eucuric salts used on botany mounting papers appear as a gray-black silver sheen, indicating that you should be aware that mercury vapor might linger in storage cases. But many other pesticides, such as arsenical compounds, are not obvious, yet leave harmful particulate residues, which can be inhaled or ingested. Sometimes an organic object in perfect condition, when other objects have pest damage, is an indication of a pesticide treatment. When acquiring an item for a collection or working on a project, you should try to obtain archival records of treatment. If the item is more modern, ask for safety data sheets on the materials that were used to create the object. You may acquire an orphaned collection with little data or start working with a collection that was incomplete, that has incomplete records. In any of these situations, identification of treatment hazards will probably require specialized analytical testing and possibly the help of a health and safety specialist. Objects can also acquire toxicity through environmental contamination. These hazards can sometimes be predicted, such as mold following a flood or a leak. This category also includes fiber and dust contamination from storage or building materials like asbestos containing insulation or lead-based ba um, lead paint used on walls and exhibitions. Specialized training is required for even minor cleanup of lead and asbestos. Also, debris from pest infestations such as carcasses, casings, grass, and bird droppings can cause severe allergic reactions as well as certain lung disorders and bacterial infections. A pest mitigation specialist may be needed for these. Don't forget that any given object may have one or more of these properties. A mirror may contain mercury, but it may also be heavy, awkward to carry, have broken glass, or an insect infestation. Up to this point, we've discussed that the identification of hazards requires various levels of knowledge of the collection, environmental condition, and production techniques. Having a hazard is not the same as knowing the health and safety risk, and this is a really important distinction that we're going to talk about. Just because you've identified a hazardous object in your collection, it doesn't mean you have to get rid of it. As we've just discussed, a sharp shell is a hazard, and a deteriorating mercury mirror is a hazard. I would guess that more people feel comfortable handling the shell than they do handling the mirror. This is because you've already internally done your own risk assessment. The goal of our presentation is to help you set up a management plan that will assist you in navigating the hazards of your collection so that you can feel as comfortable dealing with the mercury mirror as you do with handling the shell, even if that means getting someone else to help you. A hazard is a material's basic property. Your shell is sharp or your mercury is toxic. A risk is the degree to which that hazard affects your body system through illness or trauma. Understanding risk involves understanding how you'll be working with a hazardous condition. Hazardous, a highly hazardous material may not pose a high risk if proper safety controls are in place. You also have to be trained on how to use them and then actually use them. So you have to actually wear your gloves when you're handling things. The risk can change for a specific material depending on several things. The kind of safety protocols that are used, how the material is used in the object, and the quantity of the material that is present, and the route of exposure. You can reduce your risk by either reducing the contaminant or by reducing the possibility of exposure. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some examples of collection-based hazard versus risk. Um, I just lost my screen. <clears throat> I just lost my screen, so if we want to answer a question or two, we can, we can do that. Oh, and we're back. Okay. 
let's start with controlling the hazard using handling techniques. Formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen and can be extremely hazardous if, if inhaled or absorbed through eye, skin, or mucous, mem mu mucous membrane. However, with proper health and safety protocols, as you can see here, any potential exposures to formaldehyde, formaldehyde can be minimized. In the majority of cases, prudent health and safety measures can significantly reduce, if not eliminate, risk. So here you can see all the personal protective equipment they're wearing. Personal protect protective equipment refers to things such as gloves, goggles, aprons, and head protection, and I um, might refer to it as PPE um, in some cases. Now, this is an extreme example. Most collections won't have large vats of formaldehyde. You may have one or two jars of preserved specimens, but the handling protocols don't change. Even if you're only topping off one specimen jar, you should still be following the same procedures of local ventilation, wearing a respirator if you don't have proper ventilation, gloves, careful handling, and still control materials just in case. Next, how the hazardous materials is used also changes the risk. Here's the case of vermilion or cinnabar. It's a sulfide of mercury, so high hazard. It can be found as a mineral specimen, carved into decorative artifacts, or ground up as a pigment colorant. Here you can see in the upper left that mercury droplets actually form on the surface of the mineral specimen. In most paintings, or as a colorant in Asian lacquers, it will be mixed with a binder. This reduces the risk, although it is still not entirely eliminated. However, unless the surface is severely degraded or damaged, and with careful handling, the likelihood of your painting that contains vermilion um, is unlikely to affect anyone's health and safety. It's higher risk when it's underbound, deteriorated, or as a carved or raw mineral specimen. Proper safety controls become more critical to controlling risk in these cases. So even if you wear goggles to protect yourself, you need to be aware that loose pigment or mercury droplets can easily be transferred from your gloves to other surfaces. And then there's the rosary. Some items remain high risk no matter what precautions are taken when handling because of the high probability of the precautions failing. The rosary pea is made into jewelry in, many, in a variety of cultures, but contains a, a toxin which is similar to ricin and has the potential to cause total bodily system shutdown. So in this case, it would be considered extremely high hazard. Even with proper warning labels and safety protocols, rosary peas remain high risk. Even the smallest exposure can cause severe illness or even death. In some cases, limiting access may be the only appropriate step in risk management. The Rosary P also demonstrates how understanding roots of exposure affects risk. The effects of the toxin in the Rosary P depends on whether it is breathed in, swallowed, or injected. The major signs and symptoms of poisoning depend on how someone was exposed referred to as the root of exposure, and how much they were exposed to, or the dose. Understanding how a hazard can have a health effect is essential for taking the appropriate preventative measures. For example, the elemental mercury um, that comes out of mirrors is primarily a concern when it is inhaled as a vapor. Less than 1% of the total amount of the mercury is absorbed if you held it in your hand or if you swallowed it. But if you create vapor by agitating it or using a vacuum to clean it up, nearly 80% of the inhaled vapor will be absorbed into your body. Similarly, asbestos poses an inhalation risk, while lead is primarily a hazard by ingestion. So let's take a minute or two to stop for questions. And is there anything about identifying hazards that we want to answer questions about? Okay, the, um, this is Kathy Makis, and I'm going to uh, answer a question uh, regarding uh, digitizing large numbers of fur coats, accessories that might be associated with um, mercury, taxidermy, arsenical salts, et cetera, and what to do. Uh, I'm not a conservator, um, so I'm an industrial hygienist, so I will leave the digitizing uh, aspect of this to uh, Anna Kareth, but I would say that 
it, you probably are worried here more about um, residual particulates. So as opposed to um, you know, vapors. So in a sense, that makes it uh, easier. I put that in quotes. Because if you have um, a HEPA vacuum, you're talking about making sure that, one, you're not handling them, moving them, transporting them to your um, digitizing table or, or uh, equipment uh, in any way that is going to aerosolize those particles, right? So good covering, et cetera, careful handling, wearing gloves. If you have um, you know, a, a respirator or even a uh, P100 um, filtering face piece, you know, a dust mask that is acceptable uh, or, or recommended. And think uh, constant cleaning of your work surfaces for, you know, removal of um, any of those particulates. Um, the HEPA vacuum is your friend. I say that to any uh, collection uh, unit facility of any size that is your friend for all sorts of reasons, right, from, um, you know, from eggs and insect frass to uh, constant cleaning of work surfaces for any kind of um, particulate residues. Uh, Erica, Anne, you want to talk about the digitizing part of it? Um, I will say that uh, there's been a lot of studies done on collection uh, that have been treated with heavy metal pesticides. And what they found is if you really have good pe um, personal protective equipment, lab coats, gloves, um, and you uh, you can really protect yourself. Um, also, covering your surfaces with um, Tyvek or polyethylene plastic or something that you can dispose of periodically also can help you kind of control those substances. Okay, Kathy, do you want to um, answer the um, next question about um, herbaria? On herbaria, yes, this is, um, so what has, as, if you have a herbarium um, and, and uh, botanical collections, you know that one of the, the, the go-to treatment pesticide preservative was mercuric chloride. People dipping them in the field, you know, uh, uh, spraying them on, et cetera, and you probably have lots of uh, herbaria collection that have some residual um, mercuric salts associated with them. And from my understanding, um, you can tell me uh, if I'm wrong here um, on the IH, but the uh, mercuric salts uh, do not actually penetrate into any of the, um, uh, the, the specimen material, botanical specimen, which makes it perfect because they sort of, sort of coat and cover without ruining the specimen. The problem is that over time, even though mercuric chloride is known to be a very stable compound over time, I mean, you're talking decades and decades, especially in storage, it will uh, disassociate in a complicated mechanism uh, so that you will have some of the chlorine um, uh, vaporizing, vaporizing is the wrong word, I'm sorry to say, but, uh, but the mercury will, um, the elemental mercury will vaporize within the case. If you have older mounting papers, um, then they will, might have some sulfur in them. And so you will see this mercuric sulfide uh, gray-black sheen start to, um, to happen on your mounting papers. So that's your first clue that you have an issue. Handling those with gloves is, not, is, is fine. But what happens is that you still may have mercuric vapor, mercury vapor building up within your collection and within your storage cases that then becomes a problem when you open the, um, uh, the case, and if your cases happen to be leaky or if they're older wooden core ones that are not, you know, as, as airtight as, they, as you'd like them to be, you may have this, uh, this problem within your storage space. Uh, okay, the recommendation Kathy, we're gonna to, is, Kathy, we're going to have to stop there so we stay sorry. on track time-wise. Uh, we'll answer more of your questions. Um, and another question break. So keep keep them coming, and we'll try and get back to some of these older ones. And if we don't get to them all, we're going to try and answer them on the online forum in the future. So let's discuss the importance of creating a safety plan for handling these objects. The Rosary P was an extreme example of why collections should be safe. But often the question is raised, why is this important? Or is it really worth the expense or time or resources when I have all these other things I need to be doing? 
Managers are responsible to both their staff and public for providing a safe, healthy, and enjoyable experience. <clears throat> Ultimately, it's the health and safety of your staff that benefits from a safe collection. Collections with uncontrolled safety risks are inaccessible. Nobody can come and read your books if they're covered with mold. Once the commitment is made to create a safety program, it's not as difficult or overwhelming as it first appears. The technologies of hazard control are well-developed, often inexpensive, and easily accessible. How then can we reduce the health and safety risks associated with these materials? You probably recognize that your collection requires a disaster plan. The same principles apply to these safety plans. You want to identify the hazards, protect against negative events, keep evaluating and improving the process. A safe work environment should have a number of safety programs to ensure health and safety, but also to comply with OSHA standards. The federal OSHA regulations apply to all federal government agencies and private employers, including museums, cultural institutions, and private businesses. OSHA regulations apply regardless of the size of your organization. States may administer their own programs, at least as stringent as the federal requirements, but may have additional unique requirements. If you work in a state that administers its own program, you have to follow the state laws. Every workplace should have an occupational health and safety plan, which outlines your general safety policies throughout the institution. Within this plan, there are numerous programs for dealing with specific hazards and tasks, such as using chemicals or using machinery or handling hazardous materials. Your collection-based risk management plan will identify the specific hazards in your collection. It will outline health and safety risks of working with these hazards and then establish procedures for controlling the risk. Development of the risk management plan can also rely on other safety procedures. A job hazard analysis, for example, is a technique that uses a step-by-step -step work task chart to list the elements of a hazardous task. We've included the blank OSHA job hazard analysis form in our handout packet, an example of how you'd fill one out. This example is from an AIC news article that was intended for a more general conservation task, which was using scaffolding to clean a painting. But you can see through that example the type of questions and, and process that you need to go through when addressing these issues. A written and clearly communicated plan has the following benefits. First, hazards can be systematically identified. By formalizing safety practices that you might already have in place, it ensures that everyone in, in the institution follows them. Worker efficiency is increased by not having to start from scratch every time the hazard arises or there is a change in staff. It allows for the systematic or planned budgeting of resources. A plan may not be implemented overnight, but a well-justified list of priorities can be presented during budget discussions for future projects. And finally, injuries and illnesses are reduced, boosting productivity and saving on legal costs, worker compensation, and fines. The goal of these policies is to protect workers from injuries and illnesses, to prevent assets from being destroyed by fire or structural failures, and to prevent polluting the environment. So those were some of the benefits, and it's to insist you in actually creating a collection-based plan, we've outlined the following procedures. <clears throat> Your plan must include these five elements. A clear definition of responsibilities, an outline of practices to identify hazards, an exposure assessment for determining what your actual risk is and how to consult professionals, identification of ways to minimize risk and how to perform and reevaluate them, and a system of training and hazard communication. Staff should be trained on how to follow all the procedures outlined in the previous step. Keep in mind this plan does not have to be extensive or elaborate to meet these criteria. It simply needs to serve as a plan of action for the safe handling and care of both the object and the individual. So let's look at some of these elements in more detail. A good plan starts with outlining roles and responsibilities. Managers and supervisors should demonstrate commitment to safety and health. Supervisors can make sure that safety precautions are included in budgets and project deadlines. Safety is another cost of doing business, equally as important as all the other aspects of managing your collection. Staff needs to feel comfortable reporting and discussing their concerns, as well as making suggestions on how to do the task more safely. If there isn't a professional safety consultant on staff or contract, then someone on staff should be assigned as your safety officer. Even contractors and temporary workers need to be included in all training and discussions. 
they must alert others to any risk their own work brings to the workplace. The presence of hazardous conditions can be identified through a variety of ways. Begin by knowing your materials and what to, when to expect hazards. Research the materials before beginning a project or handling an object. Second, review archival records or original collector's notes. Knowledge of past or current preservation methods within the institution can reveal hazards that might otherwise be unknown. Also understand your building's construction, how your collections are housed and handled, and your environmental conditions. If your building was built prior to the 1970s, there's a good chance lead paint is on your walls, even if it's covered with latex-based paint. Your pipe fittings maybe have asbestos mud, or your attic ceiling is covered with asbestos sprayed on insulation. insulation. Be aware of the areas that are likely to leak, flood, or attract pests. And then confirm your suspicions with analytical testing, such as radiation surveys and environmental analyses. There are various testing methods that can be applied to objects to identify hazards. These methods test for the presence of a substance and not for risk. The surface concentration of a hazardous substance does not translate to a quantifiable health hazard. For example, you may be sampling pesticides that have been unevenly applied, that have migrated unevenly to the surface, or that were selectively applied in the first place. If you have objects for repatriation, the risk is different since these objects will potentially be used. There's an excellent discussion of repatriation on the U.S. Department of Interior fact sheet that we've um, put into the bibliography. We're going to outline some tests that may not necessarily be appropriate for you to do yourself, but we're including them in the discussion so that you're aware of what is available and can know what to expect from someone offering these services. While some of these can be used by conservators and collection staff, we recommend that you consult safety professionals or a laboratory certified to perform these tests. It's important to understand the methods to be sure they do not require invasive techniques and that the object can withstand them. <clears throat> Particular hazards, such as heavy metals or organic pesticides, can be collected from the surface of an object using a surface wipe or a micro vacuum. This involves using filter paper, gauze, or cotton swabs typically moistened with water, alcohol, or other solvent selected for the type of particulate being used on the object surface. These samples are analyzed depending on the suspected contaminant. Spot tests and indicator papers can be purchased commercially, or simple chemical reactions can be conducted on site for things like lead and arsenic. And then the last three examples here are highly specialized analytical equipment, but will give you the most specific results. The most common being X-ray fluorescence or XRF. XRF. XRF can be used directly on the object without taking samples to identify elements. Since it's now more readily available in a portable unit, it's more widely used by collections to identify materials. And you can see them using the portable XRF in our lower picture on the right there. For vapor, you may see the use of a mercury vapor analyzer which has a wand attachment to use within cabinets or bagged objects. Collection of gases from a whole air sample can be conducted using a sample bag or canister, and these samples then are then sent out to a commercial lab. There are also indicator papers and powders that will change colors in the presence of certain, certain vapors. Radiation can be detected with a Geiger counter, which you could purchase yourself, but radioactive materials will also expose indicator papers and film. Certain materials, such as uranium glass, will have a characteristic fluorescence under UV light. As we said, research and examination can get you a long way down the path to identification. These methods serve to confirm your suspicions. Now let's move on to exposure assessment um, that you'll do once you've identified your hazard. And Kathy is going to take it from here. Hello, everybody. Now, we're often tempted to skip over this step on exposure assessments and go right to implementing controls. This can lead to situations where there are overly restrictive or cautious um, you know, responses or, or they're under control because of false assumptions of low risk. Because none of us can really eyeball exactly how much formaldehyde um, or mercury vapor we're breathing, you really do need to invest some time and money up front on good exposure assessments because, as we'll see later, it may save you a lot of money by putting the risk of your actual work methods into perspective. I'll give you an example of, of um, arsenic. 
Uh, I have seen over the years many studies from other, other areas uh, in which people are so afraid of the possible arsenic contamination on their collections that they are in full Tyvex and air, you know, air supplied respirators, et cetera, which is an understandable concern. However, if you're looking at the fact that the, um, the, the problem may very well be a particulate residue that can be controlled, um, as I mentioned at break, um, with HEPA vacuums, safe work situations, um, gloves, et cetera, you probably will be able to ratchet back all of that uh, time and, and money in expensive controls when actually you can manage this hazard in a more uh, reasonable way. An exposure assessment from an industrial hygienist is the one way to be able to put those numbers in perspective. We, especially safety specialists, will determine your risks by monitoring your exposure in relation to the way you do your work, focusing on that potential for injury or trauma or illness. You also need to get to know your healthcare professional or your doctor and tell them what you do, what kind of chemicals and materials you're, com you're going to come in contact with. Explain the frequency in a week that you work with such chemicals. As many biological tests, we'll talk about urine samples later, have a very limited window for testing post-exposure. I'll use arsenic again as my, my favorite contaminant. If you are handling, um, conserving, et cetera, arsenic-treated uh, collections during a week, you will want to be tested, biological tested urine sampling at the end of the week, not waiting over a weekend because arsenic has a very, inorganic arsenic has a very short half-life. This is the kind of advice that you would get if you're working with an IH to monitor all of your routes of, of exposure from that particular uh, chemical. The other thing is to realize that most of us um, in, in our business and also in the uh, medicine business do not really understand your work environment and collections. You know, how many times do you have to, to tell somebody what you do and they get the response, you know, know what, what exactly is that? So your doctor and other safety specialists are no different. Larger institutions will have safety specialists um, on staff, but smaller organizations can seek out professional help through numerous public health and safety resources, and we're going to discuss a lot of those later on to help you. So what should you expect from your exposure assessment? You've identified your pesticides, so how can you tell how you've been exposed and what the possible health effects could be? So as they say in our trade, the dose makes the poison. Exposure is defined as the opportunity for the body to receive a dose that's substantial enough to result in a negative health effect. Exposure can be measured in a variety of ways depending on the possible routes of entry into the body and an understanding of how a specific contaminant will be encountered. So possible routes of entry will include inhalation, ingestion, and absorption through mucous membranes, skin or eyes particularly. An inhalation dose, and I see from the, um, the polling that many of you have been working with health and safety uh, folks, and if you're with a larger um, organization, university, et cetera, you probably have had some of this um, sampling done. But for those of you who don't, an inhalation dose can be measured um, via a, an air sample that is attached to a calibrated pump, usually worn on your belt. The air sample is attached um, to your um, breathing zone, as we call it, which is usually on your collar around your um, a radius of a foot or two around your head. The idea is that this will follow you through the day as kind of a surrogate nose, if you want to put it that way. The results from the sampling media uh, will give us an idea of what your true exposure can be estimated at, you know, given your, your downtime, you're working close to an object, um, away from an object, that type of thing. Dermal wipes and patch tests can also estimate exposure dose from absorption through either the skin or as kind of a, an assumption of what your ingestion risk could be uh, if you are not thinking about that as a, on your skin. Um, an experienced IH will then evaluate those results against regulatory standards. Significant exposure through routes of entry other than inhalation may require biological monitoring, uh, typically blood, urine, or exhaled breath. Now, these are markers of exposure, not health effect, but they should be done, have to be done within, um, with a uh, medical clinic. Biological monitoring can help the physician assess your total body burden from all routes of entry. I'll use our thing again as, a, uh, as an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're 
handling objects, doing any kind of collection care um, inspections or conservation on an object that may have been treated with, with arsenic, and you're using proper precautions, your inhalation dose may be very little if you're doing work the way you're, you and your standard practices um, uh, call for that. So there may be very little on the, the sample that the IH takes. However, if you aren't being careful about spreading that around, it's in your break area, et cetera, you may very well be ingesting arsenic particulate in ways you wouldn't have thought of it. So arsenic will show up in the urine, even though it might not be on the, 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 uh, the air sample. And so a total um, exposure assessment would include uh, urine samples as well to give the doctor an idea of whether or not um, there's other routes of entry cause, and it might cause you some problems. Keep in mind that not every project will require medical tests, uh, but a health and safety professional in their assessments will be able to tell you whether or not, say, the amount of naphthalene in the air from those old clothes donations you have that contain mothballs might require your staff to process the collection, see the physicians for further medical counsel. So back to Kareth. Okay, so here we have um, the three-step preferred hierarchy of controls to minimize your possibility of exposure. The best line of defense is removal. If the hazard can be removed from the collection, then there's no longer a risk. Obviously, as a collecting organization, this isn't really going to be an option most of the time. So the next is to isolate the hazard, and then the final defense is proper work practice, teaching people to work safely and provide the equipment and environment to do so. <clears throat> Is the item vital to your collection? Could you deliver the same message with a replica? Can certain elements of the collection be removed and others retained? Try to efficient, efficiently remove anything that might have come in contact with the collection, like contaminated packing materials, and be aware of cross-contamination, cross-contaminating work areas or other objects. <clears throat> This also includes replacing contaminated cabinets. After decades of containing off-gassing materials, cabinets may have residual solids or volatile contaminants on the surfaces or even within the wood that would be very difficult or almost impossible to remove. But removal doesn't just mean having to get rid of your object. Environmental hazards such as mold or insect debris can often be removed. Always use a vacuum that contains a HEPA filter, as Kathy mentioned earlier. Uh, most people know that the Nilfus brand is kind of the gold standard for this, but you'll find that there are many other HEPA-filtered vacuums for a fraction of the cost that will also do the same thing. Remember that cleaning removes the contaminant but can create additional hazardous waste. Here you can see that they're um, vacuuming these taxidermy, taxidermied animals, and they're using extensive measures to prevent contamination of the worker and the surrounding space. Also consider using replacements or replicas such as digital copies of photographs, paper, and books, or modern replica mirrors in place of your mer mercury-containing mirrors. Consider the risks associated with your replacements. For example, fluid, um, fluid preserved collections, the majority of which would be in ethanol or isopropanol, many people think that ethanol is a rather benign and safer alternative to formaldehyde, but inhaling ethanol vapor hits your bloodstream quickly especially if you're topping off bottles or examining, examining preserved specimens for hours without ventilation. The greatest risk then might be that you become lightheaded or you fall. Hazardous objects and any materials used for their storage, treatment, or transport may require disposal of hazardous waste. We get lots of questions on the committee on how to get rid of hazardous waste, and it's really difficult to make a blanket statement about this. You really need to find out on a local level. For example, many cities or counties will have drop-off locations, or you may have to hire a professional disposal contractor. Your local, state, or environmental regulation department will know the specific tests and regulations for proper disposal and any licensing you may need. You really don't have to be afraid to call them. Many people feel that if you call these places for advice, they're going to inspect you or fine you. Um, they would really prefer that people have people come and ask for their assistance beforehand before you actually create a, a situation where you're um, creating environmental contamination. More information on hazardous waste disposal is available from the EPA. 
In many cases, objects cannot be completely decontaminated and should be isolated to prevent contamination of surrounding areas and objects. Often, well-sealed containers or sheeting, acrylic drawer tops or vitrines, or placed, placing radioactive objects behind appropriate shielding is all that you really need for storage and display. If you're working on a contaminated collection, fume hoods, ventilation trunks, or respirators should be used to protect yourself from breathing in contaminants. Safe work practices can prevent contamination through diligent housekeeping and proper handling of materials, the use of personal protective equipment, and thoughtful decisions regarding choosing and or altering treatments and collection policies. Prudent housekeeping reduces pests, dust, debris, and hazardous residues, as well as the possibility of contaminating the storage bins, cases, or flooring. Storage containers and work surfaces should be cleaned before we use or covered with removable or disposable materials. Try to segregate hazardous collections from non-hazardous collections if you can, and use closed containers or coverings for short distance transport of objects. Personal protective equipment must be selected to match the work task identified. If you're using a respirator, make sure you're using the right kind of mask, cartridge, or filter for your hazard, as indicated by the manufacturer. If you're using a respirator, and this includes disposable dust mask, it's required and that it's required for your work, it should be fit tested by a safety professional. Our handout packet includes a brochure all about using disposable face masks. The material for protective clothing and gloves are also specific to the hazard, particularly chemicals. This is a good time to talk about our glove selection chart that we have in our handout packet. When you look through safety catalogs, or if you look at our chart, um, you'll see that the glove material that you want to choose for what you're doing is one that will prevent breakthrough or degradation for at least eight hours, or whatever your, you know, what your typical work day is. So if you took a look at our chart, you'd be surprised to see the limited numbers of options you have for something like acetone which you might be using maybe to do your accession numbering or something. So you'll see that most people have, say, a, a nitrile glove around to do their accession numbering, but if you actually spilled the acetone on your hand wearing a nitrile glove, you wouldn't be protect, protected. Remember your task may have more than one hazard, and that requires different types of protective equipment for your different hazards. Personal hygiene practices are habit, habits that we all are familiar with. Things like removing your gloves inside out to prevent skin contamination. Don't reuse your contaminated materials. Wash your hands after completing tasks. Don't eat, drink, smoke, or apply cosmetics while working with hazardous collections. Don't store food in contaminated areas. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth while you're working. And use your HEPA vacuum to dis or disposable wipes to clean your break area, telephone, or other surfaces in case you've carried over hazardous particulates. Personal protective equipment is your last line of defense. That means you should have put all of your other safety protocols into effect first. Also, PPE is exactly that, personal protection. It does not protect your visitors or your coworkers while you're working. Once hazard of, hazards have been identified, it may affect how the objects can or should be treated or exhibited. A pesticide contaminated object requested for loan may have to be reconsidered if it cannot be treated, shipped, or displayed safely or special shipping and exhibition mounts and protective wraps may have to be constructed. Try to select treatments that reduce hazards and risk. For example, use non-toxic pest treatment methods as part of an integrated pest management program to avoid chemicals. Protocols for exhibition, loan, and storage should also be adapted to address risk. For ex exhibitions, consider the case and building construction. Dioramas and old mounts should be tested for asbestos and lead paint prior to demolition. You will need a, haz a hazardous material testing consultant to do this. Clearly document any hazardous objects included in current exhibitions to protect workers during future deinstallation. Hands-on displays or living collections, especially those that contain hand-me-downs, can be a real danger. There should be clearly outlined policies for how these objects are handled by the public. If your education staff wants to use a fascinating oral or a great costume that someone donated in a hands-on learning center, you must realize that some of this should only be handled by trained um, docents and not by visitors, especially children. Storage protocols also can range from simple to complex. Guns and explosives should never be assumed to be unloaded or inactivated. 
facing guns toward the exterior wall of a storage area so that no one ever walks in front of them is a simple and effective method of risk management. On the other hand, collections containing specimens preserved in flammable liquids require specially designed storage areas with fire detection and prevention controls. Once all of the previous steps have been completed, there should be a clear and concise protocol for communicating all these conditions. All collections users should be given written fact sheets about the known or suspected hazards. We've given examples of how some institutions, like the National Museum of Natural History, have created these kinds of fact sheets in our resource list. Warning signs and labels should be posted on storage room doors or shelves. Include hazards in the collection records for new acquisitions as well as newly identified or suspected hazards on already accessioned objects. Access restrictions should be posted on each case or storage area that requires special ventilation or other pre-retrieval measures. The Oh No Ethnobotany article, which is also in our resource, resource list, is a great example of creating a collection-specific hazard communication system. Any collection item leaving the collection must be accompanied by documentation disclosing hazardous materials. This is a requirement of the Federal OSHA Hazard Communication Standard. Staff responsible for shipping and receiving are also required to take U.S. Department of Transportation hazardous material transport courses and or International Air Transport Association dangerous goods training. These are provided through private training vendors. You should get hazard disclosures from your lenders as part of your standard loan paperwork. Don't assume that because you don't see a disclosure that their collections are safe, you should be asking your lenders if they, for example, have tested their collections for pesticides. All collections users, from employees to visiting researchers to docents to interns to contractors, must be trained on your occupational health and safety and risk management plan. If you don't receive safety training at your new job, internship, or contract, ask your supervisor about safety procedures. This includes periodic safety training updates. So that section may have seemed pretty complicated and overwhelming, but here's the result. This is a sample checklist for a risk management plan for residual pesticides. We've also included this in the handouts and on the health and safety website. This particular one, as I said, is for residual pesticides, but it can be easily adapted for any general or specific hazard. Now, the next time someone suspects there's a pesticide contaminant object, they find the written plan and can immediately follow the steps outlined in the plan. So now we think we have time for another Q&A break. Okay, we're going to, uh, one of the first questions that came up from a number of participants was they wanted to know more about how to deal with medicinals in their collection. Um, Kathy, can you briefly touch on that? Yes, yeah, so when it comes to medicinal, um, old chemical sets, uh, as you really, unless you know the provenance of, the, of that, the, the dates, et cetera, or how long it's been since someone's actually um, literally handled and uh, uh, documented that, you really could be dealing with a potential, um, you know, potentially serious issue. I would simply pick up the phone and call the fire department um, and ask for their hazmat, you know, experts to come out and, and, uh, and look at this with you. Trust me, as we'll talk about later in the case studies, there are lots of local, you know, already taxpayer paid <laughs> resources for you to go to. They would much rather do that. It will eventually perhaps need a hazardous materials um, specialist to come test. There was a question on unknowns. If you have unknowns in your collections, don't try to test them yourselves. Um, they really will need um, the expert. I would start with the fire department hazmat um, teams to come in and assess the issues for you. Okay, and then the other question that um, I think we don't really cover in this presentation, but I think we should address is um, the question of unresponsive supervisors. Um, when you come to them with a potential hazardous collection material um, and they are flippant or don't want to help you with the answer, how can you, as a kind of underling, deal with that kind of situation? Well, labor relations issues aside, your supervisors are, are very much legally, certainly ethically, 
but legally responsible for your safety and health and anything that you're doing on, on your work. You have the, the right um, under OSHA, you have the right to um, refuse to do work, obviously. You're in a small organization. I know that's very difficult to do, but you have to protect yourself and your supervisors and managers are responsible, as we've been talking about um, here under OSHA, to provide a safe working environment. There was a question also, I think, on how to find these. Um, there's, if you look up OSHA, um, gov or um, in Canada, everyone has the regulatory uh, agencies, you'll find the local office. This may sound um, a bit uh, drastic, but you have the, the right to call uh, a local OSHA office and anonymously ask about how to get someone uh, to comply. Um, that is, you know, you have, the, you have to take care of yourself and unresponsive supervisors have, are in really real legal trouble. Uh, so that is the hard answer. You really should find um, an OSHA office and ask them what recourse you can take. I am done, Anne. Okay, do you want to um, just start your next, um, the next portion of the webinar? Um, yeah, and I think that's, um, I think that's Kara. Yep, I'm here. Okay, so maybe now you've realized or suspect something might be hazardous in your collection. The first step is not to panic. As we discussed, there are very simple precautions and procedures that can be taken by anyone to reduce your risk. This slide just serves as kind of a summary of what you can do on various occupational specialty levels. So on an administrative registrar or basic collection management level, there are a lot of available resources for researching materials online and in the handouts we provided. If you're doing online research, you have to be really careful to check your resources, to check your sources. It's in important that your information is coming from someplace reliable, so like a museum or a government agency. You can also provide gloves, aprons, goggles, other personal protective equipment, and those things are all available through lab safety suppliers or even Amazon or the local drugstore. Simple rehousing or basic or um, bagging of materials, moving them to more well-ventilated areas or out of exhibition spaces, even as a temporary measure, can help reduce the risk. <clears throat> If someone drops off an object to donate to your collection and you have a suspicion about it, just put it in a bag, clearly label it until you get more information. Hazard communication, particularly in the early stages of dealing with a hazardous material, is important. Announce the hazard and limit access to the collection. Clearly label anything that poses a health risk with what the risk is and perhaps most importantly, who to contact for access. Perform basic sampling or housekeeping only if you have the training and the correct equipment to do so. Removing molds does not require that you be a conservator, but proper technique and equipment is important. Another issue might be leaking of hazardous materials, such as preservatives, refrigerants, mercury, and mirrors and scientific equipment. Bills such as these emphasize the importance of having a risk management plan in place and having a trained staff. Even though these materials are regulated as hazardous waste, your staff can identify the problem and take measures to evacuate and ventilate the area. In some cases, the severity of spill dictates whether specialized help is required. You can purchase mercury spill kits to clean up small amounts of liquid mercury. For medium spills, which is like more than the amount of a, of a thermometer, you should ventilate the area and call your local health or fire department. Anything over two tablespoons requires you contact the National Response Center. There are simple tests for lead or arsenic that are commercially available which could alert you to an issue. However, you should always have a professional confirm your results before continuing with your project. You could arrange to have dosimetry badges or use a Geiger counter to, to monitor radiation exposure. Um, but then again, you might need someone to help you interpret those results. And finally, make sure that your, your collection policies are up to date to address these issues. So when might you need a conservator or a preservation specialist? Anytime you have more complex treatment issues, or if you haven't had training on housekeeping techniques, or, or if more complex sampling or testing is required, you should consult a conservator. Many conservators will have the knowledge and analytical tools to identify materials or the resources to proceed with identification. A conservator can also help with proper rehousing and isolation techniques, as well as collection surveys to identify additional hazardous situations. Once you've received the proper training, 
you may be able to complete the rest of the project on your own. Conservators can also assist with replicas or visual, visual replacements or altering objects to remove hazardous materials. And finally, when do you need to call in a health and safety specialist? And this is where I'm going to call in our health and safety specialist, and Kathy's going to take you through um, finding the specialist. Well, the simple answer is really when you get to the point in your collection slash safety risk management planning that you realize you have more questions than answers and that the control solutions and labeling and training and testing we've been talking about uh, are beyond your time or equipment or budget to do without some outside help. After this webinar, we're hoping that you will sit down with your coworkers and your managers, hopefully including the supervisor that doesn't uh, want to listen, and try to merge these hazardous materials risk management steps into your existing collections assessment plan, um, IPM program, or your facility inspection and maintenance plans. You'll see that they're all, the RM principles are all the same. And when I think about it, that's one way to positively engage a supervisor who thinks this is too much work or that it's extra. You have to get your coworkers and your supervisors on board with knowing that these plans we've been talking about follow the same plan that you are for the good of your collection and that the steps are the same. They need to be embedded. That Those questions, is this safe? What should we do? Should be embedded in every step of the way. That's the, the positive answer I guess I, I would give to that. So the other thing is, is calling in people from the outside just as your Building manager maybe spends time um, learning who all the utility experts are in the area, calling them in for free consults. You should think about that, too. Um, have the fire department or your hazardous waste regulators come in and spend a morning with you with filling out the right paperwork, assessing your waste disposal levels, trying to see you know, if there's fire code problems, et cetera. They will be happy to do that before a problem happens. Remember, um, you know, you have wonderful places, and the whole behind-the-scenes tour offer is, is, um, is a, a real big hook, trust me. You also can assign your summer interns to research the types of gloves you will all need for various work. But if you need something a little more, you know, a little trickier, like a fume hood or a respirator, you will need an IH or a safety specialist. Um, I want to mention that there are certain materials like lead, asbestos, that will require an extra level. You'll need to have specialized training and state licensing. Handling or simple cleaning of asbestos-containing or lead-based painted objects might only require an OSHA asbestos awareness training class. But again, a safety specialist is going to have to provide that followed by safe work protocols and periodic monitoring according to OSHA regs. However, abatement or removal of, say, delaminated asbestos insulation from your storage area does require licensed asbestos workers and firms. So your first call on either of those issues is your state or county environmental protection agency who will have lists of those um, vetted and licensed vendors. Now, there's we want to move on to a couple of uh, case studies, but we want to mentioned to you, there's a lot of chat, I think, on, gee, I wish they would talk about specific, you know, hazards. There's, we could do three more webinars just on those alone, but, but resources. Our resource list will have a number of books, Monona Rasol's books, for instance. The SI Safety Manual has got answers on specific types of, of, of hazards, a form, you know, fire, et cetera, as well. But there's a resource we strongly suggest you might invest in, and that's the Health and Safety for Museum Professionals. It's published um, through AIC and also Spinach. Uh, the co-editors are from all of our worlds, um, so three conservators, three IHs, and an occupational physician. And it's a gateway book that covers the basics of every program and specifics on, on most of the hazards that we're talking about from all sides. They also have, as you can see this list, an amazing amount of case studies written by you, written by museum staff and collection care people on problems and ways that they have found to work with safety professionals to then take and implement those things and own their own you know, control programs. So we have a couple of case uh, studies to go through. Um, two short case studies regarding radioactive materials, uranium and radium. Now, uh, we're going to move beyond the Fiesta wear kind of, of issue because the radiation that's emitted from uranium pieces uh, is, is not as much of an issue as the health hazard that Donna Strand talks about in her uh, case study about the ingestion or inhalation of radioactive particles. Uh, she cautions in her case, in her study, about uh, commercial conservators or restoration workers 
um, that might be drilling or smoothing or polishing pieces to definitely wear a respirator and work under a hood because uh, uranium, just under uranium, uranium particles will seek the kidneys and cause um, serious renal damage uh, failure to you. So it, it's, again, the, the, the powdering and the ingestion that, that rather than just the radiation that, that's emitted. Which leads me to control of radium paint dust in the National Air and Space Museum. Now, you usually don't need to be licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when all you have are naturally occurring radioactive materials like minerals. But you do for man-made sources, such as promethium dials and spacecraft. The NRC also licenses anyone holding radium-226 sources, um, which is a constituent of radium paint on aircraft dials. At the 2015 AIC meeting, Sharon Norquist and Amelia Kyle of NASA presented working with a collection of radioactive aircraft instruments, um, a survey project uh, that was conducted with Dave Peters, who is a Smithsonian industrial hygienist. NASA has over 100 radium painted instruments. Even after they stop glowing in the dark, the radium's half-life is still 1,600 years. Pr radium primarily emits alpha particles, which can be blocked by paper or clothing, but the paint is composed of radium salts luminescent materials, and also paint binder. When that flakes and dust is formed by working on or with the instrument, the inhalation or ingestion of radium usually will lead to um, bone cancer. It seeks the bone. They conducted routine white samples on surfaces, analyzed by Dave on site with a liquid scintillation counter. But then the IH formulated a control program for them to, to work with to reduce the risk of paint flakes. Work surfaces were decontaminated, work was confined to dedicated fume hoods, tools were labeled with radioactive stickers, instruments were individually bagged in polyethylene bags to prevent aerosolization and cross-contamination. It's all very inexpensive um, way, an easy way to contain that particular hazard. So this resulted for them as a safe, world, self, safe well monitored working environment and a safe plexiglass case for public display, which kept the dose well below regulations for the public. While this required the assistance of someone knowledgeable with radiation safety with the appropriate instruments, the actual control plans were easily done by staff and maintained by staff. Now, this um, should be published uh, soon in Object Specialty Group post prints if you have access to that in some way. Next one, um, given the news coverage, we couldn't have a discussion of hazardous collections without talking about Damien Hurst. You may be familiar with this artist, um, his amazing sculptures, and his work involving mammal specimens preserved in formaldehyde. There was a published report recently by a firm that reported high levels of formaldehyde in the galleries around the Hearst displays at the Tate and also in Beijing, I think, at the Summer Palace. Now, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on those test results, etc., cetera, um, but they did seem to cause quite a stir, in England at least. Once a week, for instance, is detected after a fact, it's very difficult to back calculate possible exposures. And by now, the real issue is how you handle public perception and understandable concern. So while you, never, you may never have one of these um, in your own collection or exhibit, it's a good example of talking about anticipating hazards in your gallery um, display design and pre-planning uh, because the public, frankly, does not expect any risks from visiting a museum or gallery. So here's Pam Hatchfield describing how Boston's Museum of Fine Arts successfully displayed, without any problems, one of Hearst's away from the flock in 2004. First, the formaldehyde was handled by an embalming company um, accustomed to dealing with large amounts of formaldehyde. The case of the object was an integral part of the piece and was specially constructed to withstand any leaks made of laminated tuffet glass, steel with silicone caulking, to sheets of toughened glass to composite laminate between. Area vapor monitors were installed in the exhibit area, connected to a specially installed ventilation system uh, with a dedicated duct and fan from the um, actual uh, formaldehyde tank to the outside, set to activate when the sensors detected a certain ambient concentration of formaldehyde. Evac plans were developed, disseminated, people were trained. They had two portable formaldehyde monitors two wall-mounted monitors, all of them with recorder outputs and dual alarms. At the conclusion of the exhibit, a professional hazmat handling firm removed and disposed of the formaldehyde. Environmental consult uh, consultants conducted formaldehyde monitoring in the galley and adjacent spaces throughout. And all of those um, 
uh, uh, monitors, sensors, were tested periodically and calibrated, but they never alarmed and never went off. Staff wasn't permitted to be, to be present and the evac, um, during the installation or removal, and the evac procedures would have been identical to that initiated in the case of a fire alarm. Uh, so it fit into their, uh, their fire um, uh, uh, alarm you know, scenario. Now, the last case study, um, again, here is, has to do with, with circus tents. Again, you may never have a circus tent in your building, but the point of this one is formaldehyde, as you know, is going to give you a problem. But a large traveling exhibit that may block exits or sprinklers, you may not be thinking about that unless you make safety review a part of every exhibit design. This last case study is from Mike Fragon, the safety manager at the Science Museum of Minnesota, who makes this point. The moral of the story is that it's better to work with the authorities than to try to run and hide from them. This um, particular exhibit, several circus style tents with activities inside that would allow visitors to become somewhat disoriented. They brought in a senior uh, fire inspector to review this as they were trying to do, and he said, well, you got a million dollar sprinkler system here that you're intentionally obstructing with a bunch of tents. And on top of that, you're encouraging people to go into these tents and do activities that you know will disorient them. So Mike said, uh, yeah, that's about it. That's what we're going to do. So the inspector said, well, at least you're asking us instead of trying to end around us. So let's see what we can do. They added some portable smoke detectors, extra staff to leave the public in an event of emergency, a good evac plan, and some training. And the fire department was satisfied. And quote, we enjoyed a successful run of the show. So this is how he ends, though, and this is the point we want to make in this presentation. Quote, as a result of being able to work with our local regulatory representatives, calling them often when we had questions, inviting them in often to provide direction, and most importantly, following through with their recommendations, we've established excellent working relationships with our local fire, environment, OSHA, transportation. Reach the point where our exhibits division invites the fire department in to give advice on occupant loading, egress, crowd flow, and construction material during the design phases of any new exhibit development. He ends with this. What is the value of a public museum to have that level of expertise and liability protection that tax dollars already pay for? A lot. My advice to other museums, take advantage of it. Karen, up to you. So now we're going to let you know how you can try and get some of these specialists to come help you with your collection. And I'm just going to give you some resources for how you can find a conservator. The best way to find a conservator is obviously through referrals from other individuals in your area or through conservation or museum-related organizations. Remember that conservators have different specialties and may not ex have experience with all the hazardous materials that you might have. So make sure you clearly explain what your situation is. The American Institute for Conservation has a Find a Conservator feature on their website. This resource will only list conservators who are professional associates or fellows, which is an application process to demonstrate that you're actually a practicing conservator. It's not an endorsement of, or a statement of quality. There are very many well-qualified conservators who are associate members or not members of AIC, so you don't need to panic if you, if you have a conservator and that conservator is not on that list. As with every service, references and examples of previous work are important for selecting a conservator. There are also various other resources that provide lists of conservators, including local conservation guilds and other private websites. In general, a conservator will have, a better, will have better knowledge of a museum collection hazard than a, the specialist that Kathy is going to talk about. Every specialist are, will have some kind of professional benchmark that is required of their field. So you want to look for evidence that they are active with their profession, such as continuing education, ongoing presentations, and publishing. Uh, where can you find us now? So here are some of the major allied professionals in terms of what assistance they can provide to you. Uh, safety managers, um, known as CSPs, uh, you'd hire one if you needed to manage someone to manage your overall safety program. They focus on preventing injuries with emphasis on physical hazards, electrical, mechanical, combustible materials, fall protection, working at heights, power tools, that type of thing. But they're also experienced in emergency management, fire protection, training, and will have some crossover experience in industrial hygiene monitoring. 
but a more comprehensive building design and asset protection plan needs to be conducted by a fire protection engineer, usually um, a professional engineer, PE, who's skilled at designing and inspecting fire detection and prevention systems based on complex life safety and building codes that regulate flammable combustible liquid storage, egress, et cetera. Another specialist then is um, industrial hygienist, uh, certified as CIHs, usually with a background in the biological, chemical, and physical sciences, with experience in ventilation and acoustical engineering, and focus on prevention of disease or other health hazards arising from the workplace. You'd seek an assistant from an IH to evaluate your inhalation, dermal exposures from chemical noise, biohazards, particulates, and fibers. Uh, if you have, uh, many IHs are also skilled in radiation safety, but if you have lasers and use ionizing radiation sources, analytical instruments to a great degree, you'll want to seek the experience of a health physicist who's skilled by education in radiological hazard detection and protection. Occupational medicine. These are board certified in occupational medicine. Uh, every facility needs to have some relationship with a medical clinic that has some knowledge of industrial illness and injury prevention. So that is the title you're looking for. And environmental protection is kind of a, a kind of a catch-all. It's a broad area. These are uh, folks that have at least a, a bachelor's in environmental science uh, or public health. Uh, states are going to require some licensure for certain activities. You will find these these folks generally in your um, university or agency or your county offices. So if you need help with hazardous waste disposal or advice on, skill, on spill and leak control or permitting for underground storage tanks, for instance, that's who you're going to. Some of these services are can be found of um, little of no cost. You can see local, we've mentioned local fire departments, etc. cetera. Uh, free OSHA on-site consultation is, is, is something that you definitely need to look into. OSHA these services are separate from enforcement. They started this program to be a absolutely free service to small, medium businesses. Call them because you definitely qualify. Then, of course, as some people I think have mentioned, there's uh, if, you're, if you belong to a government unit or part of a museum of that, there are environmental health and safety staff on there that, you, that are there to help. They may not even know that you have an issue that needs to be inspected or needs to be um, helped. Um, academic institutions, same thing. If you are a museum that's embedded in or even archives of collecting units in their teaching collections, they may not have a clue that um, they contain some of these collection hazards. You need to find those folks. And then everywhere around the world, certainly here um, in the U.S., public health and safety regulatory agencies have great websites uh, for, you know, with, with podcasts, videos, et cetera, for program development. That is a great free so, um, source of information to help. And then, of course, our own professional organizations worldwide. We have some listed here for um, industrial uh, occupational hygiene, and uh, the link talks about consultants that you can find in occupational safety per se. Again, ASSC has a directory. International organizations, Health Physics Society in the U.S. for radiation safety, and these two links for occupational medicine clinics practitioners. Now, we definitely want to talk for a moment here about once you've decided on a health and safety professional, it's important to remember that that we don't really understand the workplace. Most industrial hygienists, this is sort of below the the screen for. Um, uh, most physicians and healthcare professionals. So because they're focusing on how you're going to do work, when you, this is what you need to explain, have this information ready. Details on your work activities, just a detailed description of your duration. This is gonna, this is gonna help them figure out how to do your exposure assessment. Any of the data sheets or the records of treatment that we've been talking about already. Any expected exposures or concerns you have preventive measures that you already are using in place. And for a physician, you definitely want to share your pre your hobbies and home. If you're doing any of this on the side, you definitely want to get into that. Any other available data, such as XRF or radiation surveys. And then if you are testing the object or specimen, as we talked about, many of the, you have to ask the IH to detail their methods and materials uh, very carefully 
so that you can explain to them what restrictions your collection has on those and there won't be any, any uh, you know, mistakes and problems. Karen? Okay, Susan, if you just want to put up our last three questions, we kind of want to take an assessment of whether or not we had an effect on you guys uh, handling your collections hazard. And to finish up, we want to talk about that we have um, all the resources that we gave you in your in your handouts, as well as um, we'll be working with the Connecting to Collections Care to sort of develop a health and safety, more health and safety resources, not just on this topic, but in general for their website. So, and finally, we just want to say that um, the ANC Health and Safety Committee is, is here to help you, and we have all of this great information on our website and on our wiki site, and that you can always email us if you have questions about anything. So I think, I'm not sure if we have time for any more questions or if Susan needs to take. Um, I think what we should do is tell you that we will answer all of the questions that have been posted. And we'll either do them in the forum or as a, a trailing question a document that I will put with the recording and I will post what happens so that you all know. Please fill out the, the evaluation. It's right here. And um, also I wanted to tell you about, oh, I wanted to tell you that um, May is the, the month for uh, emergency preparedness in museums and cultural institutions. And you should check for the May Day activities that are on the AIC website. I posted that in the very beginning in the chat box. And I will post this recording, the resources, the PowerPoint. And then when we get the trailing questions, I will post them. They'll be ready in uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. The, everything but the questions will be posted. And as I said, I'll let you know. And this is great. Thank you so much. And I think we are done with these guys. And so thank you very much. The next one is on uh, is in June. Look on the website, and it will be on caring for guns and ordnance, uh, weapons and ordnance. So. Um, take a look at that. I'm sorry about the time thing with this. We had uh, a little bit of difficulty. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot, and uh, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Susan.